Rar travels around with me to uh, conferences and basically anytime I have to travel. A few years ago, um, I left Atlanta to move to Nashville for the company I currently work for, Moontoast. And uh, as kind of a way to communicate with my son, who was three at the time, uh, we kind of had, had this thing. He's like a flat Stanley, if you're familiar with that. Um, he goes around, and I'll take pictures of him um, wherever I am, and he has his own Facebook page. So that's, that's, what, he's do that's, what's, that's what he is doing right here. So um, My name is Ben. I uh, work for Moon Toast in Nashville. Uh, we also have offices in Boston and San Francisco. We uh, build ad unit, we'll, we have a platform for enabling brands to build social rich media ad units uh, and then distribute those in the social stream. So Facebook, Twitter, um, Pinterest, Tumblr, wherever. And we measure analytics on all of that. So that's what we do. Uh, I am the software architect there. Um, in terms of this talk about modern PHP, it's something that's been on my mind for quite a long time now. And uh, I've been doing PHP for nearly 14 years, almost 15 now. Um, and preparing for this talk forced me to uh, think back on uh, over the years, and uh, this slide is intentionally blank, uh, <laughs> think back over the, the years and started uh, causing old memories to be resurfaced. Uh, I know a lot of people here uh, from way back when, and, uh, and so I've been around for a long time. So lots of, lots of kind of stories started coming to mind. Uh, fond memories of like the good old days, so to speak. Uh, the days when building a website simply meant creating a few HTML pages and it might have like a dynamic guest book or something like that. So it was a trip down memory lane. So I hope you will permit me to wax nostalgic a bit as I kind of take a trip down memory lane to look at what PHP used to look like uh, when we built applications uh, and then to bring us forward through what improvements have been introduced into the language that make us build diff uh, our applications differently today. So this is a picture of, uh, th this is me right here uh, with a smirk on my face. Uh, Aaron Wormus, uh, who actually lives in West Palm Beach now, I don't know why he's not here. If anyone knows him, uh, please, uh, please let him know that he was dearly missed. Uh, Aaron snapped this picture of several PHP folks as we rode through a tram uh, in the heart of Amsterdam during the International PHP Conference Spring Edition in 2005. It also includes, if, if you're familiar with any of these people, if you've been around for a long time, it includes Steph uh, Fox, Stefan Schmidt, Tobias Schlitt, Stefan Neufeld, Christopher Kuntz, and Marcus Wolf. And that was my first PHP conference ever. And it was the first conference I ever spoke at. So if you can imagine, the first conference you ever attend and the first conference you speak at is pretty daunting. But my PHP story goes back even further to the year 2000. I first encountered PHP in the year uh, 2000 in March. Uh, or April, uh, around that time frame, and I was working in a small web development shop in Roswell, Georgia. I had been given the task, as a lot of us have, have been given this task, uh, to make some updates to a website, right? So naturally, what did I do? Being the novice developer that I was, I uh, fired up an FTP program and uh, connected to the production server and opened an HTML file and made my edits and saved it directly on production. Right, because that's the right thing to do, especially when you're a novice. I can uh, so, but actually, the page I opened wasn't an HTML page. It ended in an extension. It was .php3, if you remember that. Um, there were no development or staging servers back then, so um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So the file ended in .php, but I didn't really know what that file extension meant at the time. Um, when I opened it, though, it was mostly HTML with some PHP tags thrown in there. So it didn't really matter. I was able to make the changes that I needed to make, save the file, boom, it was done. The client was happy. And that was really the important part. Until that point, I had only worked with mostly Perl and Active Server pages. So looking in this file wasn't really foreign to me. I was familiar with an embedded script, uh, scripting language. Um, but PHP was new. And I didn't really know that it was version 3 that I was working with or that version 4 would come out later that year. So fast forward five years, and I found myself speaking at a conference in Amsterdam after having contributed lots of help on the PHP general mailing list, which I would encourage you guys to do. 
Uh, I've written a handful of articles at this time uh, for PHP magazines, uh, like PHP Architect and the International PHP Magazine, which is defunct, and uh, contributed a chapter on to a book on PHP 5. Uh, at the time, that book was called PHP 5 Unleashed. Uh, it's John Coggeshall's book. He's, uh, he's around here somewhere. I probably thought that I was hot stuff, and there was a fair amount of hubris, I'm sure, and, and that's, that's what the smirk's all about, I, I guess. I, I, was, I was a big deal, or I thought. But needless to say, as I round out my 14th year on PHP, uh, using PHP as a primary development language, I've seen an awful lot of changes, and I'm humbled by the very small part that I've been able to play in this community. It's been a really good community, and, um, and so I've been really excited and glad to be a part of it. So PHP goes back to 1994 and 1995, when Rasmus Lerdorf released the source of PHP to the public. The PHP we have today is very different from what it looked like back then. The project moved quickly, and we saw PHP 3 released in 1998, PHP 4 in 2000, and then so forth. And this is what, uh, actually, I, I put this up here because I, I thought it was kind of interesting to look at. This is what the uh, PHP website looked, back in 19, uh, looked like back in 1998. I pulled this up from the Wayback Machine. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, it kind of almost looked like this until just, till, until just very recently. So uh, uh, the, the web development team uh, did a great job with the new, uh, the new rollout. So uh, that, that was, uh, we're all very happy to, to see the new site. Um, but back in 2000, when I opened that first PHP file over FTP, I noticed that it had the file extension PHP 3. If you've been using PHP for a while, you'll rem probably remember that we used that convention for uh, naming our files. There was PHP 3, and then when PHP 4 came out, a lot of people started using .php4 as the file extension. And it was during that time frame of the PHP 4 um, era that we that kind of fell out of convention. Uh, but not only was PHP as a language different, we wrote PHP code much differently than we do today. This isn't just due to changes in the language, but also a result of promoting best practices and the creation of new tools to use as part of the PHP development stack. I think that PHP 5 paved the way to make all of this happen. PHP 5 Beta 1 uh, was released on June 29th of 2003. Uh, the general availability release came out a year later on July 13th, 2004. It was long awaited and met with tons of excitement from the community. Who was around back then working on PHP? Was anyone in here? Okay. Do you guys remember when PHP 5 was coming out and all that excitement that was gearing up towards it on the mailing list and on blog posts? And um, we didn't have Twitter back then, so uh, IRC. Um, I began using the beta version right away, as a matter of fact. In fact, I deployed it the beta one on a production web server for a city uh, government website, and they continued to use that same version of PHP for about the next three years. They, they didn't even upgrade to the stable version when it came out, but oh well. I would not encourage you to do that. But there was so much excitement on it, there were tons of books written about it, and this is only a handful of books. Oh, actually, that's the PHP 5 Unleashed book that I was talking about earlier. So PHP 5, the reason it's so instrumental in the way we develop PHP projects today is because of a lot of the new features that rolled, rolled out. And every major version of PHP since then has built on those, um, those features and has rolled out newer features and uh, more improved features. And this has allowed us to have new projects that could do things that they used to not, we used to not could do and those projects have influenced and inf helped enforce or encourage best practices, as I'm going to talk through in, in just a little bit. So PHP 5 had a brand new object model, very different from the PHP 4 object model. It introduced the standard PHP library. We had type hinting, um, at least in terms of uh, objects and arrays. Um, exceptions, simple XML and DOM. The DOM extension was was a brand new one. And as you recall, back then, XML was still like the big thing. That's how you communicate between uh, uh, different services. Now we just use JSON, and everyone's happy. And then uh, PDO. Uh, 
um, PHP data objects, a, a, way, a unified way to communicate to uh, databases, different databases. So what was different about the object model of PHP is that it was now passed by reference by default instead of previously in PHP 4 where every time you passed the object into a method or a function or assigned it to a new variable, it, it copied it, it cloned it. So in order to get around that, because objects in other languages were always passed by reference, we used a little ampersand, right? Um, so we no longer had to do that. It introduced class constants, static methods and properties, visibility, public, private, protected, uh, abstract classes and interfaces. We, we got a real proper um, object. And it introduced the autoloader, which is going to come back uh, later, because I think that the autoloader has been crucial and critical to uh, a modern PHP development. Excuse me. I'm not going to go through and read all of these. Obviously, you wouldn't like to hear me do that. But PHP 5.1 came out, had lots of new changes. And these are just some highlights, some significant improvements. PHP 5.2 came out later, and still more significant improvements. Uh, we got the JSON extension added to the language. Um, some more date time programming. PHP 5.3 came out, and now this was um, probably since 5.0 was a major significant release in the way we develop applications today, as I'll get to. And that's because it introduced support for namespaces and late, late static binding, Lambda functions and closures. These all now became part of the language. And so as you can start seeing, maybe just, just from this in your head, you're thinking, oh, I, I use projects that do these all the time now. Um, and then we got some other syntactic sugar. And, and actual um, better garbage collection and all sorts of good other goodies. 5.4 came out. Did it switch? Okay. Um, still more stuff. Now, the thing is, though, we're a lot of people are still using 5.3, and that's really good. But it's time to upgrade to 5.4. 5.4 introduces even newer things that uh, are good for the language and good for projects, but a lot of those projects aren't upgrading uh, their code to use these features because not a lot of people are running 5.4 and 5.5 yet. But traits in the shortened array syntax, for example, um, and the built-in web server have been, which don't run in production, but is great for uh, development and testing. 5.5 came out, and Rasmus spoke a lot about this the other day, and he spoke about some new stuff in, in 5.6. Um, but generators and coroutines, and the finally keyword, and these are concepts that uh, are, are frankly, you know, they were over my head when I first looked at them. I, I had no idea what they were because I, you know, like I said, I've been developing primarily PHP for the last 14 years, but other languages have these concepts. And now PHP has them, and uh, they allow us to do some really powerful things uh, when, when used correctly. And then 5.6, which is out, I believe, in alpha right now, um, that has these new things in it. Constant scalar expressions. Uh, Rasmus showed an example of that the other day, uh, yesterday. Um, did he show an example of veridic functions? Okay. So lots of good stuff there. Here's the premise, though. Modern PHP development isn't as much about the changes that have been made in the language as it is about the changes in how we build software with PHP as a result of those changes made to the language. So the changes in the language support the ability to build software in new ways with new tools. Let's talk about how that has affected the way we build software. While PHP 4 had support for objects, inheritance, encapsulation, and so forth, it was during this time that the community began promoting best practices for object-oriented programming and the use of design patterns. Jason Sweat published a book called PHP Architects Guide to PHP Design Patterns in uh, 2005. And there were a whole lot of talks and, uh, and papers and articles published and blog posts published on best practices for object-oriented programming. We still have some of these today um, because as, as I, I think there was a little bit of a lull in the best practices there. And now I'm starting to see more conferences having better, more object-oriented programming talks. And I have some uh, resources to point out uh, towards the end. So the benefits of OOP, 
laid the foundation for what would come next in PHP. PHP by no means invented these, right? Other languages had them, but uh, it borrowed from other languages. PHP does a good job of borrowing from other languages and making those features sometimes even better than how other languages address them. So these are the features of OOP that PHP now got. I'm not going to um, go through each one, but I would say if you're unfamiliar with these words, make them a part of your vocabulary. Become familiar with them uh, because they provide um, some best practices for your development. Likewise, design patterns were things that we were at now able to take advantage of. Uh, so these kind of patterns, these are only a handful of patterns that I picked up here. Um, uh, they're the most kind of notable ones that, that you hear about. Um, but now that we started thinking in terms of design patterns, there was one pattern in particular that became really critical to PHP development, application development. And that's the model view controller pattern. You've probably heard this talked about. If you're not familiar with it, uh, go look it up. But the model view controller uh, pattern is, um, is a pattern that gets implemented in almost all the major frameworks that are out there. And we started talking about this around the middle part of last decade. And that's when the framework scene in PHP just exploded. Uh, so some more reading about object-oriented programming and design pattern reading. Mastering object-oriented PHP. Uh, Brandon Savage is here. He actually gave a tutorial or a talk on OOP. Uh, and he's got a book. So that, that's a recent uh, book. Jason's uh, book, of course, is still good um, for design patterns. And then uh, Learning PHP to Design Patterns by William Sanders. The next big thing that really became a uh, big movement in the community uh, was talking about security. Again, this is uh, the middle part of the decade. And uh, it wasn't that uh, people had no clue about security before, but people had no clue about security before. And um, it was around this time that uh, a number of significant and popular attacks happened. Uh, just really simple attacks, too. And, um, and then we all realized, oh, I'm vulnerable. Uh, my website's vulnerable. My, 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 my forum is vulnerable. And, and, and uh, we started getting more security conscious. Um, a lot of people started giving talks at conferences, writing articles and blog posts. Most uh, notably, Chris Shiflett launched the PHP Security Consortium. Uh, and later, he published Essential PHP Security, uh, while Stefan Esser pushed for greater visibility uh, and focus on fixing security's uh, issues deep within the PHP core. And so he contributed the, the Suison uh, extension, uh, which is part of the Hardened PHP project. And in most distributions today, at least until recently probably, uh, still included that extension. Uh, other books were published. And um, other people were talking as well, not just these two, uh, about security issues. And recently, though, uh, Chris Cornett, uh, some of you might know him as Enigma, uh, raised, uh, has raised this PHP security banner again with his websec.io project. Uh, and then Anthony, who is also here, uh, talks an awful lot about security and, and blogs about it. So what are some terms that we introduced to the lexicon? And these are terms you should know and be aware of. But they're, they're the big ones that we all became very familiar with during this time. Uh, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, session hijacking, and section fix fixation are the big ones. Now, these are ones that I kind of expect almost every candidate who comes in uh, to interview for a job with me to know. And uh, they are all terms that uh, became part of the PHP community lexicon. And what I mean by that is that previously we just didn't talk about them. And they're not anything, that the language itself didn't change to uh, accommodate these, I, although I will point out a change uh, in a few minutes. Um, but it just became part of our best practices to talk about security and to implement new security um, measures within our applications. The two biggest things that we learned were to filter input and escape output. Doing these two things will mitigate most of the attacks that are that, that these are, are caused by. I'm sorry, most of these attacks. But PHP did introduce uh, a new feature in uh, 5.2, uh, 
It introduced the uh, filtering extension, and it's uh, it's in the core. Uh, it's by default in PHP, so you have it in your uh, installation, I'm fairly certain. Uh, there are four main functions within that to help you filter and sanitize data. And I would encourage you to learn about those four functions and to use them in your application. The thing to think about, though, is I think we've gotten away from uh, our security conscious mindset because the frameworks do a lot of this stuff just for us out of the box. However, we have to be diligent and uh, learn about the, these uh, attacks, learn about how to mitigate them, uh, and understand the principles behind it so that we don't get caught with our pants down. Some essential reading. There's uh, PHP, uh, Essential PHP Security by Chris Shiflett. Very short book, but it is still very good reading and still very applicable even today. Uh, Websec.io is a uh, website that Chris Cornup maintains uh, to uh, highlight uh, security issues and to talk about security. And then Anthony's blog, uh, occasionally he um, posts um, um, blog posts about security. And he tweets a lot about it as well. Another thing that uh, we started talking about, and another thing that we've made advances within our community, uh, had nothing to do with the language again, but was version control. So changes in PHP didn't lead to advancements in version control, but PHP is not the only language or the only technology that's been progressing over the years. Other communities advanced version control systems, making them more mature and robust. And the PHP community started growing up, and we began promoting good coding practices. And part of this included the use of version control. So as you recall, I was talking about my experiences as a novice developer. And the way I did uh, development was using FTP. Uh, that's the way you know, a lot of us probably started that way. Um, but after FTP, I moved on to, uh, I found this tool, awesome, cool tool called Dreamweaver MX. And uh, if you remember Dreamweaver MX, uh, you'll recall that there was like a file locking uh, mechanism in it. And what it did was allow you to remotely access files on a server uh, or on some shared machine. You would check out that file. It would lock it. And so no one else doing the same thing from their computer could, could get the file. It was locked. This was all great. Uh, and so it wasn't really versioning, but it was uh, a way of ensuring that you didn't blow away someone else's changes um, while, while you were working on it or while they were working on it. Uh, it had an interesting side effect, though. I had a developer who would constantly check out files, locking them, and then when he was done with his work for the day, failed to unlock them and leave. And I needed to work on those files. So I would go in uh, through FTP and remove the lock files so that I could work on the files. So it, w it was uh, not, not foolproof. Um, but we went on, we matured, and I moved on to CVS. Uh, and then later subversion. And then now we have lots of uh, mature tools uh, in distrib distributed version control systems that are out there. And these aren't the only three, but these are the big three uh, that uh, different communities use, Git, Mercur Mercurial, and Bazaar. They do things differently than subversion. They do things a lot differently than CVS. Um, but these have allowed us to have uh, better development practices, allowed us to um, I, I tend to think of it in these kinds of terms. Um, when you start going down this path and you start becoming security conscious, you start be, you know, using good version control systems, you start uh, reading up and, and, and building uh, OOP and, and good design pattern principles into your software, the whole software just takes on a different shape. It's, it's, it's a, a very different um, beast than it was when it was just a, a simple script cobbled together and thrown up on a server. So if you don't use version control, you have absolutely no excuse. They're so super easy to use these days. Uh, just use GitHub or Bitbucket. In fact, GitHub has a tutorial that'll take you right through it. And if you, uh, if you aren't using version control, come see me and I can, like in 15 minutes, show you how to use Git on your computer. Uh, whether it's Mac, you know, Linux, or, uh, uh, or, or Windows. I might have some trouble with Windows, but I, I can get around that. The other thing, so 
Um, the PHP language introduced the auto-loading uh, magic method for classes. Um, and I need to mention that because this has been critical to the success of modern projects in PHP. Um, before PHP 5, we had no way uh, to auto-load classes at runtime. We had to use include statements, require, include once, and require once to load those class files. Um, so this has significantly changed the way we build applications. It has paved the way for common conventions for naming classes and later namespaces. While different projects may have different naming schemes and folder structures, using an autoloader usually forces you to have a common structure. So it's given structure to our projects. It's done another thing. It has brought about what I'm calling the death of the page controller. Here's another thing that PHP didn't really do itself, but due to the changing way we use PHP, um, our projects, for the most part, no longer use a page controller pattern. I think this change uh, in uh, practice, I think this is a change as a result of better security practices, increase um, the auto-loading and the new object model. So what is the page controller, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Martin Fowler's Patterns of Enterprise Ar Application Architecture has a diagram that describes the page controller, and it looks a bit like this. Now, at a glance, it sort of looks like Model View, control uh, model view Controller as well, but there is a significant difference, and that's that uh, every page itself is the controller, and you really don't have a front controller uh, in this system. What it ultimately boils down to is your applications look a lot like this. You've got a whole bunch of PHP pages, You've got a web server. When a request comes in for that URL, it just goes through Apache or, or whatever web server you're using and goes directly to that page. That page might include other files, like a common include file or configuration or something like that. But ultimately, the page itself is what controls the output. The problem with this approach and the reason I think security awareness auto-loading and OOB, OOP principles killed this is because your, your folder structure ends up looking a lot like this. Um, we built our, our projects with everything in the web root. So this classes folder here is not a cascading style sheet classes folder. It's all your PHP classes are in there, if you wrote pack classes, right? Um, you might have a config file or include file and then you have an, you know, your, your main index file. You've got page one and page two and so forth. Um, everything is in the web root. Why is this bad? Well, a few years back, you might remember that Facebook had this interesting thing happen one day where suddenly um, when you loaded Facebook.com, you didn't get your, your profile and your news feed. And I don't even know if they had the news feed back then. But um, you didn't get all the, all the good Facebook stuff you got a plain text file that was all PHP code. And it's because for, for a split second, or I don't know how long it lasted, the web server stopped pro processing PHP and just gave it back as plain text. So if you stop processing PHP by some fluke, if there are database passwords in this file, then they just get exposed. All your code's exposed. So it's not a good idea to put it in the web root. Um, so that's the security reason for that. So what we've done now is we've moved all that stuff up out of the web root. We now just have like a public folder or a www folder or, or something like that within our projects where we've got our front controller, which is an index.php file. Um, maybe it uses, you know, Symfony or Zen Framework or Silex or something like that to bootstrap it, or maybe it's your own thing. But at any rate, it, this has forced us to have at least a front controller pattern uh, while all of our other stuff lives outside the web root. Um, so they've paved the way uh, for better code structure. And with auto-loading, we're able to move the files up and then set up an auto-loader that loads in all the classes when they're needed. Additionally, though, I've mentioned some frameworks. Frameworks, um, so OOP, auto-loading, design patterns, increased awareness for security, focus on the MVC design pattern, all of that 
um, basically resulted in this explosion of frameworks in the PHP um, community. Uh, many frameworks were following these patterns or variations of them. Um, they all sprung up around this time. They've, they've matured. Uh, early frameworks were such things as, uh, you might remember, Prado and CakePHP. Well, CakePHP is still around, but I don't, I don't think Prado is anymore. Uh, but they preceded Symfony and the Zen framework. And there are too many others to name here. But all have contributed to where we are today. We've learned a lot from this prolif prol proliferation of frameworks. It has allowed the community to try many different approaches rather than settling on one particular way of doing things. They've ushered in a new era of software construction. And this is just like a handful of names uh, from the, the framework list. I think that Paul Jones in his talk yesterday uh, mentioned something about 80 different frameworks that are in the list right now uh, that people use. So while other programming language communities have their one big framework that everyone uses, um, PHP's got like many. And there are good things to that and there are bad things to that. But the good in that is that we've learned a lot. And what we have learned a lot leads me to the next point. Um, so they have created new communities, new workflows, new tool sets that we didn't have before, new best practices, Additionally, they've introduced the Framework Interoperability Group, also known as PHP FIG. Um, PHP FIG, despite some community infighting and all that goes on within that, ultimately has brought our framework communities all together in a way that they are now working together. I was talking to someone the other day about frameworks, and uh, I think I was saying that we use Silex for some stuff, but Ultimately, it really doesn't matter what you're using anymore because uh, if, you're, if you're going kind of the micro approach or minimal approach, you just use whatever packages from whatever framework you want. I mean, we use some Symfony packages. We use some Zen framework packages. We use, uh, actually, I, I think I have an Aura package uh, in there somewhere. And it's just because there are different tools now in the frameworks as they have components, and we're able to use them. They talk to each other. Um, they interoperate. Um, so what FIG has brought us is, is that kind of getting together of the different framework communities to try to solve common problems. Uh, hasn't always worked, but what they have published are four sta or five standards um, that I would encourage you to go look up if you're not familiar with them. Um, but they have two auto-loading standards. I won't get into why that is right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, PSR 0 and PSR 4 basically set up a, this is going back to what I was saying, auto-loading tends to give us a common structure for our projects. These define what that structure looks like for the frameworks who want to follow these, uh, uh, who want to be a part of FIG, basically. When they're a part of FIG, these are the uh, standards they agree upon that all of their frameworks and libraries will, will follow. Additionally, they've introduced basic coding standard and coding style guide. These are things that the frameworks follow. You don't have to follow them. But they're good for us. They introduce consistency uh, to the community. And so when I go into a GitHub project and I'm, I'm looking for a package uh, to implement something within my, uh, my, my application, I can start looking through code and I'm seeing code written all in pretty much the same way, all adhering to similar, uh, if not the same standards as a result of these. And that's good because I don't have to like change um, I, there's not like context switching between different packages. I look at this package, I look at this package, I don't have to, I don't have to judge it based on the code quality. Well, I might have to judge it based on the quality of what, how they're do, how they're approached, but that's, that's what I need to judge it based on. Not based on whether they use tabs and spaces and, you know, whether, you know, they're uh, one true brace or, or anything like that. And then there's a logger interface. So, I was talking about coding standards, and the reason I, I brought that up is because what a lot of this has done for us, we write our applications differently today in terms of coding standards. When I used to write PHP applications, there was no coding standard. It just was how I felt, right? Like one day I want to use two, ta uh, two spaces. One day I want to, I never actually did that. But um, I did change where my braces went. I did change like, uh, other, uh, like other things around that. Um, but now, 
the community has grown up around standards. And so a lot of, like I was saying, a lot of our projects are looking the same. And, and this is really good for us. Um, in the past, we did adopt standards like the paracoding standards. But I think this, is, this has taken it forward and has given the community uh, an even better kind of approach uh, to our code. A lot of development shops have adopted them. Uh, in fact, we have. Basically, we just said, look, the FIG standards are there. We don't have to argue internally about you know, how we want our code to look. Let's just agree we want consistency and pick this. And that worked out pretty well. Another thing that the community has really uh, uh, embraced, um, I, and I say embraced, but that's because I'm, I'm saying that we make it a focus of talks and blog posts and articles and books now to talk about testing in our application. I think that there's still a lot more to talk about here. There's still a long way to go. Lots of projects do not have tests. Lots of development shops don't write tests. Um, but we're talking about them. Um, Sebastian Bergman has been talking about it for years. Um, but I think that the community and the ecosystem, dare I use that word, around PHP is now at a level of maturity uh, where it's become a major focus of developers and development shops. We not only care about what we build and getting the job done, we also care about the code we write and are treating it more as a craft. Testing goes hand in hand with treating code as a craft. Uh, Chris Hartress's grumpy persona is leading the charge from his blog, his Twitter account, and books, uh, and, and from my slide. Um, so talking about testing has introduced some other terms to our lexicon. Things like unit test, things like functional test. I mean, when I was in that picture at the beginning of the slide deck almost 10 years ago, I had no idea what a unit test was. Uh, I didn't know what a functional test was. I could have told you, oh, I, I probably could have guessed it because it has the word test in it, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you what a unit is. Uh, I wouldn't have known, I definitely wouldn't have known what test driven development is or behavior driven development. And I wouldn't have known what continuous integration is or code coverage. Now these are common terms used in our, in our community and they're terms that you should know and you should be familiar with and learn about. We also have a lot of testing frameworks. The big one, though, is PHP unit. Uh, that's the, the really popular one. There are other things written around PHP unit to help uh, with like mocking objects and so forth, but you can use them interchangeably. There's also a simple test, uh, BHAT, which is a behavior-driven uh, development approach. And then uh, one that I'm not really familiar with, but I was looking at and looks really interesting, uh, and I think several people here use it, Codeception. Um, which helps you write your test, essentially. Uh, and here's some, uh, some good reading on it. I'm, I'm pimping Chris's stuff. Uh, if, if you see him, tell him that uh, uh, he can make his check out to me later today. Another term uh, that I've been thinking about that has been introduced um, to our lexicon is dependency injection. I think this goes hand in hand with testing because ultimately, if you um, don't have some form of dependency injection within your code, it makes it harder to test. And what dependency injection really just boils down to is passing dependencies into your objects rather than creating them within your objects. So if you've got like a database class that you need to create, uh, I should have an example of this in my, in my slide, but I, I apologize. Paul Jones went over this yesterday, but like, if, my, um, if I have a method that needs access to a database, it's the difference between saying dollar sign database equals new database within my method versus doing that outside the method and passing it into the method, if that makes sense. The reason it's hard to test the first approach is because when you're running your test, your test has to execute that code, so it has to create an actual connection using that database object. You can't replace that object with something else. Whereas if you pass in the database object, then you can replace that with kind of a stubbed out uh, object, a mocked object. So what dependency injection has done for us, is, or what testing has helped us with, is writing code uh, that adheres to these principles of dependency injection, which are really simple principles, by the way. 
Uh, don't don't get lost in, in, in a lot of the, um, the the arguing about what is a service location and all that. But uh, it's helped us write our code better. Another thing that has been introduced uh, is integration and coupling. Because of all of this stuff, because of the changes to the language, componentization has taken hold. Because of PHP Fig's involvement and um, their influence, componentization has taken hold. Uh, Ed Finkler, uh, a few years ago, or may you know, maybe just within the last year or two, wrote the Micro PHP Manifesto, becoming a rally cry for smaller libraries that focus on do doing one thing well, which is a variation of the single responsibility principle. Uh, PHP code is looking a lot better. And uh, I encourage, you know, just take a look at repositories on GitHub. I'm constantly seeing uh, more and more PHP uh, re repositories there that just look, uh, it's just solid, look, good looking code, first of all, and they have tests in them. And uh, so when you're, when, another thing to think about when you're looking for packages is um, does it have tests? And can you run those tests easily and do they pass? I mean, that's what I, that's what I look for. I look for, uh, Quality of code? Are they using coding standards? Are they uh, uh, writing tests? And um, so, just go look through GitHub. You know, ten years ago, we would look at PHP libraries that were out in the wild, and they all sucked. Not all. Mine, mine were awesome, but all the others sucked. No, mine sucked too. So we're now using APIs, communicating with APIs. We we now use libraries. Um, PHP, uh, for the most part, this community is uh, not, definitely not a not invented here community. We like to use what other people have contributed. Composer is a really big thing, a really major introduction to our, uh, our, our major influence uh, in our community. And it's because of the changes in the language, it's because of the auto loading, it's because of uh, good testing practices and code quality that Composer has, has, Composer doesn't really enforce those things, but it seems to encourage those things. And this is, I, I keep repeating myself on this stuff, but when I look at a package that comes from packages.org, which is, you know, I use Composer to install that package, um, for the most part, those packages all follow similar coding standards, they all have tests. And it's not because Composer itself enforces this, it's just that community, our community, is being encouraged to, to use these best practices. Composer, I think, along with auto-loading, is one of the single most important uh, um, uh, things to happen to PHP. Where is Pear, though? Uh, who uses Pear still? Who's still using Pear? There's like three of us, maybe. Um, I wrote a blog post uh, recently, or just in the last few months, called The Fall of Pair and the Rise of Composer, um, where I talked about the, the problems with Pair, uh, mainly being uh, the fact that you know it, it had to be globally installed for the most part, um, and uh, just it kind of stagnating and how Composer has come in and just revitalized the whole concept of packages and the whole concept of external libraries. Whereas Pear was trying to have a body that governed it and ensured and enforced code quality, Composer doesn't really have that. But the best packages seem to bubble up to the top just by sheer use and the download stats on, on packages.org. And so Pear is still there and I don't know what the future looks like for them, but it seems to me that Composer is taking over and, and uh, really advancing us in, in those, uh, those areas. There's a lot more about modern PHP development than what I've mentioned here, and that's because modern PHP development isn't just about PHP, and I hope that's been really clear. It's not necessarily about the language, it's about all the things around the language. It's about the tools around how we develop and deploy PHP. And these tools include things like Vagrant, VirtualBox. Uh, these are uh, ways that I, I use these on a daily basis for my, my local development. 
uh, I always now with projects create a vagrant file and I, I spin up a local VM. I want things to be scriptable so that I don't lose them. Like if I, if I blow away the VM and, and it, it goes away, then I, I'm not worried about uh, losing all my configuration and setup. Um, the cloud has changed the way we develop. Excuse me, we deploy things on AWS and Rackspace differently than we used to, to, to do on physical servers. Platforms as a service. Um, th these services are around now to help us just write our PHP code and deploy directly from uh, our GitHub repositories. Uh, web servers, we, you know, we, we used to talk about LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. LAMP is gone. There is no more LAMP stack. We, we have a much bigger stack now. We have much, many more tools. We're, we might not use Linux or, anymore. We might use Windows. We might not use Apache anymore. We might use Nginx or some other um, uh, web server. Um, we might throw uh, MySQL out and use some kind of uh, NoSQL database, MongoDB or CouchDB or, or Postgres or you know, something else that's out there. Um, we might add other languages to our stack. We might have some Python or Ruby in there. We might use Node.js for things. So it, the, the PHP stack is, has gotten much bigger and broader, and there's a lot more tools that we have to, frankly, know about and, and use within our, uh, our, our toolkit. Uh, oh, the other thing that, like, we, I, I use a lot of queuing stuff. We use Gearman for that, that uh, but other people use RabbitMQ and uh, SQS. So there's a whole lot around PHP that's not PHP, but it's just still part of how we develop applications. The big thing is that uh, PHP is still very much a web development language. So the JavaScript and HTML5 ecosystem uh, is still really just part of the language. And there have been huge advances in what these communities are doing, especially in JavaScript. JavaScript's had this intense revitalization of its language. I mean, just a few years ago, it was kind of still that old you know, scripting language and it, you know, you, you had to use every now and then. But then when the, you know, the concepts of, of Ajax and, and uh, came out, you know, it just exploded. And now there's JavaScript frameworks out the wazoo, and uh, now people are using JavaScript on the server with Node.js. So it's, it's really fun there to see what, what's going on. But again, you use, we have to use PHP in those contexts still. So where does this leave us with the future of PHP? Where is PHP heading? Well, what about PHP 6? Rasmus actually said we might skip 5.7 and go straight to 6 uh, yesterday, uh, which I found a little humorous because when I was at ZenCon a few months ago, they were saying there probably won't be a PHP 6. We'll probably skip the number and go to 7 just because um, of the, the whole debacle around it. I mean. There were a lot of books published on PHP 6. Elizabeth Naramore published one. Her, her photograph is right there. She's right next to me, uh, I guess, in the, in the next room. No, um, actually what happened here um, was that uh, a lot of publishers jumped the gun. And uh, they wanted to uh, be the first to publish PHP 6 books. But they had no idea what was going on in the community. So they just went ahead and did this. And then the community kind of called them on it, and they, they changed the titles back. Well, the thing about the future of PHP is that PHP needs you. PHP development goes in cycles. People come and go. Arguments erupt and subside. But the language continues on. It's kind of like the English language. It borrows the good parts from other languages and makes them its own. That's its strength. But to be better, PHP needs you. So be a contributor, be a tester. Have a language feature idea, get involved and propose it. PHP has gotten where it is today because of the many, many contributors, and it will live on for contributors like you. And the future of the PHP community. Likewise, the community will live on. The community is strong. We've got user groups. If you're not in a user group, get involved in a user group. If you don't have one in your area, start one. Uh, there are community conferences just popping up everywhere. I mean, just a few years ago, 
uh, just for, as an example, uh, in 2011, I, I, I did a conference. I, I ran a conference called the PHP Community Conference. Uh, at the time that I did that, there were the big conferences like ZenCon and PHP Tech uh, in North America. There were, I don't believe, any other um, uh, conferences around at the time. Later that year, though, Lone Star happened, Lone Star PHP out in uh, Texas, and then all of the other conferences just sprung up, just like wildfire. Um, there's almost one every month now, it seems. Uh, so uh, they're often run by local user groups, which is really cool, and they bring the wealth of PHP knowledge through local and inter international speakers to these local regions. So I, I really think this has, has been a big revitalization in our community. Frameworks are proliferating, as are framework communities. But ultimately, like I said with PHP, the PHP community needs you. The popularity of PHP is only getting stronger, I think. Uh, a few years ago, there were discussions about, is PHP waning? I think that's, that's all out the door now. Uh, because of a lot of the stuff I mentioned here, uh, because of things like Composer and um, you know, other tools that we're using, PHP is just getting more popular. Um, I think modern PHP 5 features and modern development practices are making this a stronger language. But the only way to ensure this is to take part. The PHP community needs you too. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, does anyone have any questions?